Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alan Detloff, and I'm very honored to serve as Dean of the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston. And today I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to the fifth annual Makanda Brown O'Connor Distinguished Lecture, Speaking of Social Justice, featuring author, poet, and advocate, Reginald Dwayne Betts. This event today is also the final event in our year-long Eyes on Abolition series, in which we've explored abolition as a vision, abolition as practice, and abolition as a critical framework to bring about change and specifically as a framework to address the racist violence, racist inequities, and racist outcomes we see in our carceral systems. One of my favorite things to do every year is select the book for our annual social justice summer reading program that we invite all of our GCSW community to read, including our faculty, staff, and alumni. But for our incoming students, the social justice summer read becomes the first part of their educational experience with us as they read this book over the summer and then discuss it throughout their foundation experience. The books that I choose for this series reflect our commitment to racial justice and our commitment to fighting against racism and white supremacy. Throughout this past year, many important conversations have occurred about the problem of racism, violence, and outright execution of Black Americans by our current system of policing. We see that happen horribly and tragically again and again in our society. But we know that police violence is just one of the problems associated with the criminal punishment system and the prison industrial complex. Mass criminalization and over surveillance that disproportionately and intentionally targets black and brown people destroys families, separates parents from children, it ruins people's ability to earn income, and we also know it does nothing to deter crime. Incarceration is also inhumane. The inhumane treatment of prisoners is something we as a country have to begin to reckon with. And this became very apparent to me and many others this past spring during the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the beginning of the pandemic, public health experts across the country warned us that jails and prisons were the perfect breeding ground for a widespread and life-threatening outbreak because of overcrowding, poor sanitation, the inability to practice social distancing, and in cities and jurisdictions across the country, efforts were being made to release nonviolent offenders and in some cases, suspend arrests and nonviolent crimes to try to protect the population from a mass outbreak. Here in Houston, I, along with many activists, pleaded our elected officials to take similar actions. In Harris County Jail, over 75% of the people who are incarcerated haven't even been convicted of a crime. They're only there because they're poor. They're there because they can't afford bail. But despite knowing the risks of the population we're facing, nothing was done to protect them. Today, over 1,000 inmates from Harris County Jail have tested positive for COVID-19 and many have died. And at some point throughout this process, I started to ask myself, at what point do we as a society decide that someone's life no longer has value? At what point do we decide that it's acceptable for people to die unnecessarily? We should never get to that point, but that's where we are as a society because that's how we treat people in prison. So this summer I selected Felon, a book of poems by Reginald Dwayne Betts that through the author's own lived experiences tells of the harmful effects of incarceration. And today we're very honored to welcome the author of that collection of poetry, who will be sharing portions of the one man show he's developed based on that collection. Reginald Dwayne Betts is an award-winning poet, author, lawyer, and advocate. Over the years, he's transformed himself from a 16-year-old sentenced to nine years in prison to a critically acclaimed writer and graduate of the Yale Law School. In addition to Felon, he's written two collections of poetry, the recently published and critically acclaimed Bastards of the Reagan Era, and Shahid Reads His Own Palm. His memoir, A Question of Freedom, a memoir of learning, survival, and coming of age in prison, is the story of a young man confined in the worst prisons in the state of Virginia, where solitary confinement, horrific conditions and constant violence threatened to break his humanity. But instead he used this time to turn himself into a poet, a scholar and an advocate. Between his work in public defense, his years of advocacy and his own experiences as, as a teenager in maximum security prisons, he's uniquely positioned to speak to the failures of the current criminal justice system and present encouraging ideas for change. His writings generated national attention and earned him a Soros Justice Fellowship, a Radcliffe Fellowship, a Ruth Lilly Fellowship, an NAACP Image Award, and the New America Fellowship. He holds a BA from the University of Maryland, an MFA from Morton Wilson College, and a JD from Jail Law School. Welcome, Duane. It's an honor for you to be with us today. Oh, the pleasure's mine. The pleasure's mine. <clears throat> so uh, I think we'll just get to it. The next time I say something, I will have started.
What do you think about when you hear the word prison? Some folks say violence. If you know somebody inside, you might think about how long it takes to get from home to your loved one. You might think about silence. For me, when I hear the word prison, I think about books. See, inside you can uh, reach out and grab something off a shelf like this. Nah, and to understand what I'm talking about, I gotta take you back to the summer of 1998, when my world looked like this. I was in solitary confinement. I was uh, 17 years old and should have been thinking about what it meant to be a high school graduate. I should have been thinking about reminiscing on the prom, packing for college. But instead, I was in a hole. I was 17 years old and I was learning how to bid from listening to the men who would talk and shout from 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. I remember one afternoon hearing a dude say, hey, yo, send me a book. Seconds later, swish. I was in one of those old school prisons where the cells were like core doors that lasted forever. And they were parallel with a, a sea of concrete between them. And books were contraband. So I ain't know who he was asking for a book but I heard it slide across the pavement. I figured they knew each other, but a day or so later, somebody else shouted, hey, yo, send me a book. And the call back was, what sale? 13, swish. You can hear it sliding across the concrete, swish. If it was a magazine, it was like, Damn near like bird's wings flapping. And I realized that these dudes had set up an underground library. And the only code was that if you asked for a book and somebody had one, they sent it to you. After a bit, I got my courage up. Decided um, I would break the first rule they taught me about prison. And I would ask a stranger for something. Hey, yo, send me a book. Send me a book. Hey, yo, somebody send me a book. What sell you in young blood? 21. I looked out the cell and the cat was so far away from me that I could only see his arms slipping out the bottom of the door. Swish, 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 swish. And he's kind of readying the book to launch it in my cell and it's swish, and it clanks into my cell and I'm holding this. I pick it up, right? And I'm looking at it and I can't believe that this fool gave me a book of poems. I'm 17 years old in prison. Just a few months back, I was thinking about the life sentence they might give me. And I still hadn't figured out how I was gonna do the nine that I had, and they gave me some poems. All I knew of poetry was roses are red and violets are blue. But I flipped through it because I ain't got nothing else and the light, the nights are dark, you know, cold. I introduced myself with this book to Sterling Brown. Amiri Baraka, Langston Hughes, County Cullen, Lucille Clifton, Sonia Sanchez. It's wild what a book could do. Got to the point that I'm just flipping through names for real. Just trying to figure out who is who, you know? June Jordan, Ishmael Reed, <laughs> Nikki Giovanni. And got to the point that uh, I just stopped on names randomly. Gwendolyn Brooks, okay. Then I stopped on Etheridge Knight. I didn't know who Etheridge Knight was, just knew his name was Etheridge and I ain't know nobody's mama. Then on now that named their child Etheridge. I'm reading the poems and he's talking about 
46 faces taped to his cell wall. I had uh, seven faces taped to mine, and I'm reading the poems, and he writing about Freckle Face Gerald, cat that got locked up when he was 16. Knight said, uh, 16 years hadn't done a good job on his voice. I got locked up when I was 16, and my voice was uh, still cracking. I knew I would have to get a poem up soon as somebody said, send me a book. And so I wrote the poems down longhand because I wanted to keep them. Months later, I ran into Knight's bio and learned that he had spent time in prison. And it hit me. No wonder underneath his words, I could hear him singing. Name a song that tells a man what to expect after prison. Explains Occam's razor. You're still a suspect after prison. It's wild. I wrote my own thing, felon, <laughs> two decades later. And I called this felon because I wanted to announce where I'd been and say something about where I was going, right? And it's crazy because uh, if you read through to the acknowledgments, you'll see that I dedicated this joint to cats like Roger Fentress, and Christopher Tunstall, you know, dudes I did time with, dudes I met when we were young, figuring out what it meant to survive in the black hole that they call prison. And it fucked me up because the book is hardback. So I had dedicated a book to cats who couldn't get it. And I messed around and um, figured I had to fix that. And I got with some folks. and. I told myself, I said, I'm gonna make me a, a, a prison edition, a fella, you know? And I'm telling dudes, nah, 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 I'm gonna make me a prison edition. I'm gonna make me a prison edition. I'm gonna make it so like folks inside could hold this. And my peoples was like one day, um, so you making a prison edition? I mean, I thought he was about freedom. And I said, nah, I didn't say I was gonna make a prison edition. I said, I was making a freedom edition. And I hooked up 20,000 copies. Freedom edition of felon. Made a paperback. Made it so it could slide under thousands of cell doors. And if you listen, The wings still sound something like, the pages still sound something like wings. Slide them under the sails, imagining that folks get it, can hear me underneath the words singing. Name a song that tells a man what to expect after prison. Is this Occam's razor? Am I still a felon after prison? Blood history. The things that abandon you get remembered different. The things that abandon you. The things that abandon. I was in a cell with Juvie. He was on the bottom bunk and we was at one of those prisons that didn't have hot water or microwave. And so if you wanted to cook something, you had to hook you up a stove which is to say you had to take your roll of toilet paper and wrap it around your hand like this. You wrap it around your hand a few times and then you take it and cup the bottom. If you could look through it, you were straight. You sit this on that toilet sink contraption made of tin. And like the bottom, you take your soda can with a string attached to it, and you hold it over it, right? And once the uh, fire went through, and the fly would shoot through the center with all flames and no smoke, once the fire went out, your water be boiling, and you can handle your business. I'm in a cell with Juvie, and he's on the bottom bunk, and I hooked me up a stove. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy because I ain't got no soda can. I'm holding a sheaf of my father's letters over the flame and watching them turn to ash. 
the things that abandon you get remembered different. As precise as the English language can be, with words like penultimate and perseverate, there is not an exact combination of sounds that describe only that leaving. Once, drinking and smoking with buddies, a friend asked if I longed for a father. Had he said wanted, I would have dismissed him in a way that youngins dismiss it all. Shrug, sarcasm, a sharp jab to the stomach, laughter. But he said longing, and in a different place, I might have wept. Said once, my father lived with us, and then he didn't. And it fucked me up so bad that I didn't think about his leaving until I held my firstborn in my arms. And only now I speak on it. A man who drank whiskey and wild Irish rolls like water once told me and some friends that there is no word for father where he comes from. The blunts we passed around let us abandon our tongues. Not that much though. But what if the old head knew something? And if you have no father, you can't hear straight. Years later, my father says to me, boy, why you ain't give your firstborn our name? As if he ain't know some things turn your life into a prayer. The gods will certainly answer. I hadn't heard my father's name in about five years. Hadn't heard his voice in a decade. Hadn't even listened to him in real time since I burned his letters. And that morning, he took uh, two buses. He took two buses, a train, and another bus from Southeast DC to a law firm in uh, PG County, Maryland. And he walks into this spot and tells the administrative assistant, he says, I'm here to see attorney such and such. He say, my name is Reginald Dwayne Betts. And a woman looks up. He thinks that she doesn't hear him. So he says, Reginald, Dwayne Betts. Now, I met this woman months before, met on September 19, 2005. This thing happened in May sometime, you know? So I met her months before at the bookstore where I was working and she came in looking for a book and <laughs> had me read poetry to her. And shit was wild. Cause you know, we ain't started dating a months later, dating. And uh, I'd known her well enough to tell her my first name was Reginald. And so my dad says the name and she says, I think I'm dating your son. And he said, nah. He said, nah, my boy is in prison. Been in prison since he was 16. And she said, I think he home. We was at that new stage of love where you call I see the number and I smile, you know what I mean? And so I see the number and I smile and I click accept and she say, uh, nothing. Cause the voice I hear is saying, uh, son, you see, uh, no letters distinguish my father's name from my own. No signal for the mailman, the postman, my employer. The man before them is me. And not <coughs> the man before them is me, and not what follows after grief. We are no goldfinch, instead, a kind of crow, a murder of us looming. Search out history and find felonies and divorce proceedings. 
the online account of our background and song of tragedy and regret. A dozen men with portions of our name, variations and fragments, evidence of being called before a judge for everything from domestic violence to traffic tickets to something called jury trial prayer. And all I did to land me in those prison cells. And there is no way to distinguish us without a birth date, a social security number, or witnessing the tat along the inside of my right arm. Name a song that tells a man what to expect after prison. It's this Occam's razor. Am I still a felon after prison? I came home on March 4th, 2005. March 4th, I remember walking into my mother's house for the first time since I was a teenager. And I'm in there and I'm in the kitchen and I got aunts around me and uncles and my grandmama's there and some friends and my mom. And I'm telling folks, I came home on March 4th. They're like, Dwayne, we know. I'm like, nah, I came home on March 4th. You know March 4th? I'm like, March 4th. I'm insistent and my uncle like, that poetry shit be fucking him up. I told y'all. <laughs> and they laughing. And they ain't really laughing at me. They laughing with me and it's cool. But I'm like, nah, March 4th. You know, this is the only date on the calendar that's also a command, March 4th. I thought I was going to come home and leave all that prison shit behind me. But uh, my man Terrell had became born star when he went to prison. My man Anthony rechristened himself absolute. I knew dude's name, righteous, wisdom, mathematics. I mean, shit, names is who you were or who you had been. My man Chris became juvie because he got locked up as a 16 year old. My man Fats, though he came in as Roger, was Fats because he still had the baby fat of the 16 years he carried. I told dudes to call me Shahid because it meant the witness. And I came home thinking I would leave all that shit behind. What kind of fool am I believing I turned the first corner without testifying? Last four lines of a love song after prison. Prison killed you, my love. Killed you so dead that you're not here now. You're never here. You're always in those cells own you. Brown liquor owns you. And there's no room for me unless I call the police, the state, upon my pistol and set you free. My lover don't believe in my sadness. She says whiskey in that time is what left me wrecked after prison. And she might be right. My liver awash in all but dregs of a charred oak cask. Soaked in Bali's amber, shadowed as blood, dim as a cell in the hole, survived. Brackish prison water only to become collateral. The things that haunt me still drown now, friends say, in nearly 50 pounds of brick hue rock, spiritus frumenti. A gallon of whiskey weighs eight pounds, and I am driven. And all this becomes a man confessing. Dear warden, my time been served. Let me go. You promise that some of this 
I wouldn't recollect after prison. It kind of hit the ground running though, for real. I mean, I got an AA, a BA, an MFA. I was collecting college degrees like felonies. And I remember one day going into this job, right? I go in, trying to teach poetry. The lady looks at me and I look at her. I got my portfolio in my lap and I give it to her and we talk about poems. She's asking me about the gap in my employment history and I tell her about prison. She started calling me Dwayne. Yo, Dwayne, I, I think that your experience, even prison, makes you the perfect person to join our team. I'm reading your poems and you got a voice, but more importantly, what I hear you say about teaching, look, you would be an important member of our team. And she's calling me Dwayne. She says, you know, you got the job. I leave happy as hell. I mean, I got a job because something I knew and knew how to do. A few days later, she calls me, right? And she says, Mr. Betts. And I had been Dwayne just days before. She said, you got to understand that we are a nonprofit and your criminal record, I mean, the violence, I mean, you've been working with children. It's not what I think. I'm not, I'm not the person. I came home with this. It's a tattered receipt for $25.71. My last paycheck for being a GED instructor in a prison. 40 hours worth of work. At some point I stopped hearing how she was explaining it to me, realizing that she was just telling me what I knew. From inside a cell, the night sky isn't the measure. That's why it's prison's vastness. Your eyes reflect after prison. I should have known. I mean, I had a full tuition scholarship, academic, like grades and shit. <laughs> had a full tuition scholarship to Howard University yanked from me, pulled, because they found out I had felonies. Had to check a box. I thought it was cool because I went to University of Maryland, no sweat off my back. Got another degree, even did good there, you know? But I had these degrees and couldn't get a gig and my back was against the wall. Trying to figure out what to do. And I do what anybody in my position would have did. I mean, I do what anybody in my position would have did. I started selling dope. <laughs> oh, he started selling dope. <laughs> oh, man, it's amazing what people believe about you. I ain't started selling dope. I decided to go back to school. I mean, I owe people money. Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, all these folks, they wanted their money. And it was like, sell dope or go back to college. You go back to college, you ain't got paid for a minute. So I went back to college. And I'm like, what will I go back to college for? I mean, what academic pursuit is perfect for a cat that got three felonies? Hey, you right. I went to law school. Shit, I went to a good one. I remember the first day of, uh, of one of these classes. It's a uh, legal writing and research. And I'm in this class and I'm in the back of the class because I'm old as fuck. I don't want nobody to know I'm actually here for real, right? I got kids and a wife and I'm fucking in law school at 33. And, you know, Jesus died at 33, but that ain't mean much. It's kind of foreboding. Not that I thought I was Jesus, but I mean, shit, you know, numbers are numbers. And uh, I'm in the back of this class. Professor says, Law school is a place where poets go. And my God, he was talking to me. 
I mean, I got to be the only poet in law school. I know I'm the only poet in law school in this state. I ain't but like 600 people in the whole damn school. I ain't but 200 in my class. It's another poet but me. So I'm thinking he about to say law school is the place where poets go to become senator. And then I'm thinking, nah, I'm fancy. They call me a unicorn. That's what they call us at this law school, unicorn. So I'm like, law school is the place where poets go to become Supreme Court justices. I ain't say it before, but I'm black. And uh, Barack Obama was the president. I mean, it was 2013 and I swore for real for a moment that he was about to tell me law school is the place where poets go to become president. I gotta tell you, me and Barack Obama had the first agent for our first book. And so that's why I was thinking that, you know, my first book didn't take off. His first book didn't take off. He had became the whole, you know, gay that speech and then became president. And I had became like a failed teacher of poetry and then went to law school and who knew what would happen next. So this is all in my head. And then this cat looks at me and said, law school is the place where poets go to die. And it fucked me up. I mean, He wasn't even being funny. He was warning me about how I was gonna learn Latinate and statues and law. And I spent years in law school trying to figure out how not to kill the thing in me that gave me life, right? And I get to uh, one point where I'm about to graduate and somebody gives me this case and they say, Dwayne, you gotta read this. This is right up your alley. Somebody done sued the state I say sue the state? How they sue the state? You say class action lawsuit. I say class action for what? They locking people up because they poor. Yeah, man, they locking people up because they can't pay bail. They locking people up because they can't pay traffic tickets. They locking them up, and these folks say, nah, that's unconstitutional. He said, read this joint. So I read it, and I'm into it. I'm like geeking out on it, right? <laughs> and then, like halfway through the eighty pages, I realized that I'm about to be a lawyer because I'm geeking out on statutes and legalese and I'm like my folks would love to read this but they can't they don't care they don't know about the numerosity and commonality and federal rules of civil procedure 42 I asked myself um how do you take something like this and turn it into a song and I came up with this in the middle of Alabama, the people versus the city of Montgomery, the plaintiffs impoverished, jailed by the city, unable to pay traffic tickets, pay or sit in jail, $50 per day, plaintiffs unable to pay, each sent to jail told they could work off debts, $25 per day, cleaning the city, scrubbing feces and blood from jail floors. The treatment reveals the city against its poorest, jailing people if they poor. Plaintiffs seek fundamental rights, they suffered. The city's unlawful. It is the policy of the city to jail people. It is the policy of the city to jail people. It is the policy of the city to hold prisoners until extinguished. It is the policy. It is the policy. Plaintiffs seek relief. Name a song that tells a man what to expect after prison. It's this Occam's razor. Am I still a felon after prison? My father was born in 1960. Eight years before the king's assassination sparked the torture of his city, 
and 20 years later, just as crack would make my father's home burn again, I arrived like that man's shadow. The room fills with us when I enter. Our regrets, our anchor, our history, an echo that sounds when I speak. The 10 years I now own somehow more and more like the decades he has lost. Though, in a way, I know this is the kind of thing he called bullshit on and point out that there is nothing in the cracks and tremors and bass lines of my voice that suggest a six story window he leapt from, as if to test the theory of man in flight and a tattoo wings that I obsess over. I did eight years in prison. Eight and a half for real. I didn't get a single tattoo. I've been home for a decade and still didn't get a tattoo. Had every opportunity and declined. And then I walk into this spot called the warehouse. And I walk into this room and uh, it's this huge, huge, huge sculpture. I'm talking about, it fills the entire room. It's a stack of books made of wrought iron and metal and wood. And it's ways shooting out the books that's so fucking long. I mean, if I had the Kimbe Matumbo's arms, I couldn't touch from tip to tip. I walked in and the sculpture filled the entire space. And I never had a tattoo. I got to show it to you. You look at this thing, right? And you ask yourself, um, you ask yourself, Is this enough, really, to grant a man flight? Is this enough to give somebody wings, to give them freedom? I thought I was going to get this tattooed on me, and I called my folks, right? I say, um, I say, listen called my dad. We had been talking and we had gotten to talking about um, what life meant. We got to talking to each other like we were uh, sale partners, you know, revealing intimacies and vulnerabilities that we wouldn't tell others. And I said, Pops, I think I'm going to get this tattoo, this, this, this thing, you know, and I described it to him. He said, Nah, son, don't desecrate your body. And we know he used more drugs than either of us could name. He's like, nah, I'm fucking with you. But like, what would you get on your body that meant that much? And I tried to explain to him how a book in a cell, you know, it took me 25 hours to get the tattoo on my back. And I came home after it was all finished and, uh, my son, he saw his name because I got him to put one of the books out so you can see the spine. And my youngest son, Miles, he saw his name because I got his name and Kai's name and Teresa's name. And he said, why you get your, why you get my name on your back? I was like, y'all, the story that gets me through all this, you know. And he didn't ask me about um, what was in the pages of the books that he couldn't see. But had he told, had he asked me, I would have told him that it was filled with the names of friends and their sentences and their hopes and their crimes. And my own hope that there will be some uh, set of wings, some gale force produce that would be enough to set them free. Parking lot. A confession begins when I walk into a parking lot. The man was waiting for home asleep in a car after a working man's day. Everything I know of home is 
captured by the image of a man running from the police, his arms flailing unlike any bird you'd expect to fly. Walking into a parking lot begins the confession. The burner is a key and afterwards there will be no home to find. My boots echoed against the black of asphalt. Hours before I flashed the pistol on that family, I kissed my mother goodnight. I told my girl that I loved her. But when has love ever been enough? Halfway through my first year of law school, you know, my man Juvie hits me up and said, yo, Fats wanna holler at you, man. He said, yeah, you know, I'm telling everybody you in law school. So a bunch of dudes been asking me like, yo, Shahid gonna represent me? I know you fuck with Fats though. So I gave you info and shit, he probably write you. And uh, Fats hit me up and Fats like, yo, Shahid, man, Juvie say you go to the best law school in the galaxy. And I gotta let you know that brothers on the yard clowning you for saying that shit. Cause we don't know what that mean, but look, you know I'm innocent. And it's the thing, me and Fats came into the penitentiary together. You know, he was in adjacent sales at receiving and he would tell anybody who would listen, hey man, I ain't do this shit. Be like, what you went for? I ain't do it. I'm gonna tell you this, the prosecutor offered me 20 years. I said, nah, then he offered me 12, then he offered me nine, then he offered me five. But my thing was, why the fuck I'm gonna plead guilty to a murder ain't commit. He was 16. And that uh, jury of his peers sentenced him to 53 years. And so he hit me up. He like, shot. you know I ain't do this shit, man. And I'm on the yard and dudes is talking shit, trading war stories. And this cat tells a story that is eerily familiar. He say the cat talks about how uh, he had shot this dude coming through to buy drugs from Fats neighborhood, and he say, he say later he pulled dude to the side and tell him, man, that story you told, that sounds so, so close to the shit that I'm locked up for, shit I got 53 years for, and they changed details, exchanged details and, and talking, and yeah. This dude writes an uh, affidavit and said, it wasn't, it wasn't Roger Fentress that committed this murder. It was me. And he writes the affidavit and signs it. And Fats is like, look, we send it to everybody. Prosecutor, judges, defense attorneys. Defense attorney that represented him had died. The uh, you know, the victim had died, the witness had died, everybody was dead, the judge had died. Only the prosecutor was alive. And he said, Man, we sent it to everybody. Prosecutor even said he agreed with me, but what the fuck? You gotta do something for me, shy man. Am I going to fucking die in here? Parking lot two. A confession began when I walked out of that parking lot. A confession began when I walked black out of that parking lot. A confession began when I, without combing my hair, dressed for a day that would find me walking out of that parking lot black. There's so much to be said of a black boy with unkempt hair. He meets the description of the suspect. Suspect is running, but what black boy hasn't run away from things far less frightening than the police? Essay on reentry. Telling a story about innocence won't conjure acquittal. And after interrogation and handcuffs and the promises of cops blessed with an arrest before the first church service ended, I become my father. The tape sparrowed my song back to me. Later, in a letter, my victim tells me, I was robbed there. The food was great and drinks delicious, but I was robbed there. I would consider going back. He said it as if I didn't know. Why would he return to a memory like that? Why would he return to a memory like that? As if there is a kind of insight that rides shotgun with the awfulness of a pistol in a dark night. There's a Tupac song that begins with a life sentence. 
Imagine I scribbled my name on a confession as if autographing a book. Tell your mother that. Say the gun was a kiss against the sleeping man's forehead. Say that you might have been his lover and that on a different night, he might have moaned. For a bell denied, I won't tell you how it ended and his mother won't either. But beside me, she stood in some things neither of us could know. And now all is lost. Lost is all in what came after the kid. And we should call him kid, call him a child. His face smooth and without history of a razor. He shuffled ghostly in the court. And let's just call it a cauldron and admit his nappy head made him blacker than whatever pistol they said he'd held, whatever solitary awaited. The prosecutor's bald head was black or brown, but when has brown not been akin to black hair to abyss? And does it matter, black lives, when all the prosecutor said of black boys was that they kill. The child beside his mother and his mother beside me and I am not his father. Just a public defender near starving here where the state turns men, women, children into numbers. Seeking something more useful than another guilty plea. And his boy beside me is withering on the brink of life and broken. And it's all possible because the judge spoke and the kid says, I did it. I mean, I didn't. I mean, Jesus. Someone wailed and the boy's mother yells, this ain't justice. You can't throw my son into that fucking ocean. She meant jail. And we was powerless to stop it too damn tired to be beautiful. Keese, Juvie, Star, Absolute, Fetz, Luke, Chicago, Pops, Grace, Snake, Smoke, Slim, Malik, Blue, Black, Yousef, Bass, Black, Trigger, Vanessa, Popo, Snoopy, Bolivia, in Venezuela, in DC, in New York, in LA, in the dozen men named for cities or countries. Most of us would never see or see again. Cyrus, Mad Dog, Momo, Divine, Shorty, Forty, Wise, Can't Get Right. Who would name a child Can't Get Right? I bet his mama did that too, called him Can't Get Right. All he did was talk too much and laugh too loud, but he always seemed to be in a fucking way, in a way too eager to please, so eager to please that he ends up in a prison cell, ends up in the same hell that we call home. And his name and all the names become an elegy. The elegy of a cell door closing. And the judge would say, count the trees in the parking lot where there were only cars. Zero. The same number of stars you could see on a night in the city. And the judge would say, let my man Luke know that the parking lots would be crowded with oaks and spruces and pines and willows and grass and maybe horses before the smell of the city on a Sunday would reach any of them. A word for this story is Azalea, the purple bouquet Luke's mother might bury her face against if she known for most judges, a sentence and as a funeral. Another purple is bruise, a body lost to time, a somebody disappearing in the cells, a vehicle for more waste, a court becomes a wake. Fats once washed his hands against the air as if to say fuck, everything. Imagine no head troubled his face when he got laced with those 53 years that afternoon and he never held a razor, not even inside his mouth. The best weapon a man could hope for unless you were the fool who tussled with a Louisville slugger. The razor under his tongue turning into a prayer. His hands leaping to his face and blood appearing as if 
always there. And a man's hands fumbling against the air as if ablution could be found in blood. And remembering reminds me that hands washing the air like that might be a kind of holy, a plea, a reaching for cars, for trees, for wild horses, for all the violence a brother might know to make of himself free when innocence fell. After Fetz wrote me, I got him a lawyer. And by my second year of law school, I was representing Juvie on parole. Juvie had life in prison for murdering a dude that he said murdered his brother. Fetz had them 53 years. I thought I'd gone to law school to become a public defender, but suddenly all my clients were dudes I ate in chow hall with. I just represented Luke on parole. He had life sentence for a case where they tried to rob somebody and his brother, his cousin, it was his cousin, ended up dead. You know, the dude they tried to rob had a gun, shot his cousin. For that, they gave Luke life in prison. Facts, Juvie, Luke, all been locked up for 20 some years and what none of them free. And I got hooked up with a chance to go to the parole board and talk to the chair of the parole board again, specifically about Fetz and, and, and Juvie's case. I flew down to Richmond. Walked into this room to talk to the chair of the parole board, wondering what I might say. I mean, in my eyes and everyone else's, we thought Juvie was going to be free, but no after no after no made it not seem real. In fact, he had an uphill battle. I ain't know what to say walking into that room, and um, I ain't had but 40 minutes. What do you say in 40 minutes to get somebody out of prison? And before I walked in and fucked me up, it hit me, man. It hit me that these, these men I know from prison have all known more years in cells than cities, than school, than lovers, than their favorite cousins live, more years than freedom. I met them before B ran his time up over five inch black and white, before K broke somebody's jaw with the lock and the sock. Back when everyone thought they'd go home, before T went home and was murdered, before J went home and came back. One time rapping with Fetz, he gives me the mad for men I did my bid with. Yesterday, I sat at a table with Star, remember him? I was looking at his bald and head and he was looking at the grays that cover my crown. I looked at Juvie at a near table, both crown and beard stubble completely gray. And just that afternoon, a mirror had reminded me of my disappearing self, androgenic alopecia, a word for our vanishing hair, Latin describing how time will cause everything to recede. No word exists for the years that we've lost to prison. And I thought, Fetch, Describing a moment he shared with men he's known for a score of years in prison. I was thinking about all that loss, but he writes, looking at the landscape of gray that had become them, he realized it was far from over. Because all these rounds later, prison ain't still undefeated. And one of these days, we might find us some free. Titus Kafar etched faces against these gray bars. He knows redaction is a dialect after prison. It's wild. I got Julie. 
Luke sent me these sweats and said, uh, Ruth, paper maker, take these tattered gray sweats, make paper of our bids, a pass we won't reject after prison. I got them to send me these sweats. Clothes that they worn when uh they been what they used to look fly on the yard. Then um uh, what they wore to sleep in, then to work out in. A geography of time and suffering in every pair. And I turned them into paper, wanting them to be to exist outside of prison. It's crazy because uh, at the time they all had life sentences left. And I wasn't sure if they'd be free. Then folks start coming home. Uh, Fats got a pardon. Luke came home on parole. Juvie came home on parole. I mean, me, Fats, Juvie, and Luke, we had all been assessed to my state prison together. All in the same housing unit. Juvie was the barber, and we stand around the barber chairs and just just chop it up, you know. And they were all home, and it was the middle of the pandemic. Imagine four of us home, three up off of life sentences, and we couldn't even talk to each other. Couldn't chop it up at all. Juvie came home in May, and then he died in December. Some shit the doctor couldn't identify. But I know uh, prison, I know prison. Prison kill you in so many different ways. And um, all I have is a stack of letters, you know. Letters he written me over the years. <laughs> letters he written me saying, oh, Fex needs to talk to you. He write the letters on yellow legal tablets, you know. And uh, he was dead and all I had was the letters. In the prison paper, and I said, uh, Yoko, add these handwritten letters to the years eclipsed. Make prayers, a thousand kites, beauty, few expect after prison. And she did. I mean, she would float 11th century rediscovered Japanese letters into the paper. Letters from a city that no longer exists. She float mica and sediment into the paper and she float the letters of Man Juvie. Crazy. It's kind of like what I had left, you know? Shit. It's like part elegy, part prayer, part memory, a thousand kites. And this one right here, 6900 Atmore Drive. Letter probably a decade old. Juvie asked me to write the parole board and try to get him free. Name a song that tells a man what to expect after prison. Is this Occam's razor? Am I still a felon after prison? Thank you. Thank you very much for that really just moving performance. Um, it's such an honor to have you join us. And I know our students have, have really been looking forward to, to hearing from you um, after they read your book this last summer. I want to now introduce our moderator um, for a short Q&A section. Um, our moderator today is one of our current MSW students, Alexandria Williams-Rich. Um, she's a 2017 graduate of Tulane University with double majors in sociology and Africana studies. She'll graduate this August from our program with a specialization in health and behavioral health. 
And in her time at the GCSW, she's been a member of the UH chapter of the Association of Black Social Workers and one of the lead organizers of UH Revolution, which is an organizing effort to combat police violence on campus. So thank you, Alex, for being part of our event today. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for having me be part of this team. And thank you so much, Mr. Betts, um, like Dean said, for that absolutely moving, beyond moving um, performance. Um, so, um, so again, just thank you for giving our students and our community at large um, the opportunity to experience your work as a solo show. And so our first question um, is, you know, what inspired you to offer Felon specifically in this format? And what do you hope audiences might take from this particular presentation that they may not find otherwise when reading the work? I don't know. Um, I mean, I mean, this is, this is a bullshit answer, right? Like in some ways, I don't know, but in some ways, you know, like it's, it's two different mediums. You know, theater is a different medium from poem. And, and poem invites you to go back and again and back again and back again and back again. And theater kind of says that I hope to create a landscape that you could like live in over 90 minutes, 75 minutes in this case. And that over that 75 minutes, something changes inside of you. Um, and, and also, you know, theater is a, a, a really public, um, a public genre, you know, it's a public thing and, and poems is, in some ways, a different kind of intimacy. And so I hope, you know, we didn't just share me giving a poetry reading in which like you were hearing one poem and like, I, I, I would hope if it's good, you know, it was it was just like a whole experience and, and it had an arc and it had something that grabbed you and it made you think about the poems that you read in a very different way. Mm -hmm. It absolutely did. I think that's a really um, good way to look at it that not only does it, you know, lend, you know, motion and a visuality to the words, like you said, it helps you see the story, the art that much more clearly than just reading them. Um, so in an article that you wrote last fall for the New York Times um, called Kamala Harris, Mass Incarceration and Me, you grappled with a number of questions that always arise in conversations about abolition and prison abolition specifically. You talked about prison as a factory of violence and despair. And you also talk about violence and accountability, your mother's experience with assault and questions of violence, vengeance and justice. Um, can, you know, as much as you have, can you talk about how you have and maybe are still wrestling with those questions and other things you think um, that's important for us to think about in these conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think that those questions, those questions are sort of fundamental. You know, mm -hmm. I represent people who committed murder. And it's just like you can't walk around it. And um and sometimes we want to name what accountability is as if that's how the community feels. You know, we want to like like frame accountability around the righteous, but the community includes the righteous and the broken. And um, and if we want to take seriously what that means, it, it just has to be a complicated and messy conversation. And I used to spend a lot of time telling people, like, trying to figure out what conversations other people weren't having. I was like, fuck that shit. You know what I mean? Like, I did my eight and a half years in prison, and I know people who kill people, and I know the people, uh, I know the conversations that I have with them and that I have with my friends. And the thing about being an artist is I don't have to pretend like, um, like, like I've done a study on this. You know, other people represent the people that they represent. They represent the ideas that they represent and their ideas and all of the things they say is meaningful and is valuable. But I'm from the dudes that struggle with the fact that they're going to die in prison because ain't nobody trying to get them out. And I'm from those same dudes who are trying to deal with what it means I've killed somebody. And I'm from family members who's like, don't call me asking for the freedom of the dude that killed my folks. Fuck him. You know, and it's complicated. And I try to I try to write things to speak to how complicated that is. And I tried to write that piece to speak to how complicated that is. Um, I've constantly and frequently found myself in the middle of these conversations where, where people are just like straight ideologues. And they're like, yo, let's condemn this dude that has, you know, these sexual assault allegations. Let's make him a, a, a pariah. And, uh, and I would push back and be like, I don't know. I mean, 
that seems antithetical to my abolitionist discourse. <laughs> and they would be like, see, you always trying to coddle predators. And, and, and I remember years of dealing with this shit when I had never talked about my mom's experience, you know, because I wasn't going to use my mom's experience to um, as evidence that I take this thing seriously. But now, you know, a bunch of things happened that, that made it clear that my mom thought it was OK for me to write about it. And that's why I wrote the piece. And, and now, you know, I find myself just deeply trying to grapple with all the, the complexities of it so that we could lay it on the table and, and figure out what we really willing to say about how we want people to suffer because in some real way prison is suffering you know and I, I don't think about prison as accountability i think about it strictly as punishment and if you think about it strictly as punishment then we should ask ourselves how much do we want people to suffer in our names and i think that we are we afraid to do it you know i was so devastated about how many people called in like showman's conviction accountability like in what world is that accountability especially when you know it might happen tomorrow that's not accountability that's punishment and okay, we can say he needs punishment, but we also need to ask ourselves how much suffering are we willing to have happen in our name? That's really, I think you're hitting on like a lot of those key parts of conversations of abolition, right? Where we have to wrestle with the, like the uglier parts of our tendency towards um, punishment and retribution in lieu of you know, real accountability and asking ourselves what what can accountability look like outside of a system like formatted on punishment, which is like you said, is what we have right now. And so, um, so last fall at the GCSW, we began a series exploring abolition as a vision, practice, and a critical framework for change. We've had a lot of guests who have expanded ideas of what abolition is and what it isn't, yourself included. And we, you know, are here to explore your work within that context as well. Ruth Wilson Gilmore describes abolition as a way of seeing. Abolition makes us ask, when you look, what are you seeing? And what would you rather see? Their hmm. poem, if you reimagine the world as you want to see it. So I'm just going to touch on just a part of it. Um, but let's say the world is ours. On that day, all the silenced tongues would have speak without fear that would be carved out of days in which their hands and bodies do not suggest weapons. Days where all their mothers and sisters can walk down any street in this world with the freedom that comes from knowing you will be safe. And so with that in mind, can you talk about, you know, the work that you have for us, meaning however you conceive of it? Yeah, uh, one, let's say shout out to Ruthie. You know, Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a library named after Pops here in New Haven. Uh, <laughs> oh man! And uh, what's interesting though is because I, you know, I got. It's kind of hard to be an abolitionist in America. I mean, my homeboy killed somebody that killed his brother. It's like this is, you know, and um, a lot of people in prison for killing people that killed their I mean, dudes. I mean, I seen. You know, I seen a dude get this owe somebody six stamps. The guy he owed the stamps to was holding the stamps to pay him back, but I guess the dude got so blood. And like, and we were walking from outside wreck to to back to the sales, back to the housing units, and um, uh, and I remember the guy that was getting his ass beat, telling the guard and pay attention to what's happening. You saying you didn't do anything, and um, a crowd of people stepped over him to go back to their cells, to get out of the way. I stepped over them too, stepped over them down. And uh, and they took all of the little property. <laughs> but we still had adapters. Somebody's head and I would use an adapter. I am closest to naming my soul. Me hearing the lukewarm stories of violence that I saw in prison. Lukewarm lit so long his arm because he was in prison and tried us. I was thinking about Sadia Hartman's scenes of subjugation and what does it mean to constantly put images that make us um, no longer susceptible when I realized that like the con a friend asking me to write about a feminist. I thought, why the fuck is she asking me to write this shit? Like I've never been one, but she saw something in me. Or Thinking an abolitionist mindset then when they, you know, were first along those lines, 
there's long decline in these sentences. This has been my issue for a long time. I was um, in an amicus brief for that. You couldn't get life without parole for a non-homicide offense if you were a juvenile. And I and I actually was really crazy, legitimate. But we went circuit where they use the life expect the kind of crimes that get included in this umbrella. And I get that. But about non-homicide offenses. But the trick of it all was that it always said you couldn't get a mandatory you to be able to get a sentence if they somehow can. Because how the fuck is a judge supposed to be? a? It, it, it doesn't even seem like 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 legitimate. He right? was the side and vote in all of these cases. And if you go back to um, for v, Louisiana, um, Sanford v. Kentucky, Stanford v. Kentucky. Where the kid had gotten, he was 16, and this was after a case called Tom Kennedy. So in Stanford, it what fucking world, right? But that's what the case concluded. In Stanford, he actually um he got his his, his sentence um commuted to life without parole. But anyway, Stanford happened, and in 2005, when um was that Kennedy was on the court and he flipped his position in Stanford when he heard Roper. So anyway, my point was that Kennedy was more or less the deciding justice in all of these cases pieces is in trouble right it's suspect and this is the first case well, actually the dc sniper case i don't know if you remember the dc he was like 17 mm -hmm. going to the supreme court but what virginia changed the law even i was so he so he no longer had an issue so if you read my the first person or the only person to predict this but we knew that this was in trouble and this was before um never hire a black supreme court uh, law clerk Ruth Bader Ginsburg unfortunately passed away and ACB to somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who can you imagine never had a black person at a job that's that elite, like actively not hiring black people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to work that hard not to hire black people. Kevin has hired more black law clerks than her. And so we live in a, a, a sort of system that's very, very muddled because you have Kavanaugh writing opinion. Some black law clerk worked on that case. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a real tragedy. I will say though, the positive is that the states, you know, this abolish life without parole for juvenile offenders. But Jean did the same thing by bringing back parole for people who got locked up when they were juvenile. Really disappointing. Like, ultimately, the way that we prevent the Supreme Court from legislating, yeah, that might matter. And legislators can make decisions that say, no, they can require later if somebody's incorrigible. And that, that decision is just wild because things OK. But what if they didn't use the discretion without? It was um, depressing, but mm. such is life. Right. I think you also hit on like the role in these conversations and in these decisions because I'm born and raised in Louisiana and now I live in Texas. Both states that are not, you know, very friendly towards imprisonment, people in the system. And so um, that's just what, you, you know, got me thinking about. Yeah, but, Louis, but, but Calvin Duncan did more than 20 years in Louisiana about his business. He in law school right now. And he the one who spearheaded bringing a case to the Supreme Court, big people with non, um, non-unanimous juries. Yeah. And they were one of the few states that were still doing that. And this mm -hmm. dude, this dude did more than 20 years and fought for his own freedom and got himself out, you know, and then kept fighting for the freedom of others. Right. Like Norris Henderson. I mean, I think it's really something to be said. If I'm hopeful, it's something to be said about these guys that's inside that's like really doing the work mm -hmm. and actually spearheading, these efforts in ways that they don't really get acknowledged. Those dudes are important to like say their name women and these folks are doing for the legal framework that can be pushed and um and, and press these courts in ways that you know they need to be pressed consistently. Mm -hmm. We're centering the work and the voices of those who are special. Um, so yeah. we do have a question from the audience that I think is going to be put on screen. What words from letters helped you and others make it through your time? family you get letters from from friends you get letters from strangers it's the very idea that somebody i hate the word re-entry um and one of the reasons why i dislike the word re-entry i have about it now in my head is that it suggests that you are in society when you're in prison mm -hmm. and i think we need to do a lot of work to make that like just like factually untrue and 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 experientially untrue and letters, receiving letters from your loved ones is one way to make it experientially untrue. It's so wild. I mean, if I was in prison from 16 to 24, how can you, did, did you get sentenced to, to, to like not have any intimacy? Grown men get sent to prison, married and, and can't touch their partners. Women get sent to prison, married and can't touch their partners. People lose their reproductive years. You know, when I think about abolition, it, it's not just like, like what a, a sentence a person might deserve in prison. 
It's like, what do we deserve to do to a person as citizens? Like, what is okay for us to do to people? You know, to, to rob somebody of decades of touch, mm -hmm. of decades of closeness. Um, and I think we don't think about that. And letters is one way to push back against that. But um, I don't think it's a specific thing that got me through it. It was, it was all of it. And sometimes it was drawings by children who I didn't know and might never know, you know? So um, to round things out, this is going to be um, my last question for you before we hand it over back to the dean. When describing the time before you went to prison, you once wrote, people knew me before leave clovers, doing backflips and making too many jokes. I didn't know who I was. And you also wrote of your cousin, what Rez needed most, time to both fail and grow. No one was willing to offer him. So can you talk about the harm society imposes upon children by sentencing or even killing them in the cases of Tamir Rice, Adam Toledo, and most recently, Makia Bryant, as they're figuring out who they are in both families? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's the entire expectation mm -hmm. of, of what we expect the folks that, come in, that we come into contact with. And we have no pause. You know, you send a kid to prison for a decade for robbery, 50, 60 years for murder. You have no sense that they might not, you have no sense that they could become something else. And you send them to the absolute worst that you could imagine. And you have no structure. Some states have, they have developed structures because they like these kids are coming in and they're so vulnerable. We got to put them under, we got to put them in the care of some adult that would try to take care of them. How absurd is that? I'm going to send you to prison and let me find some adult that will take care of you. <laughs> like, and I've talked to like heads of the DOC that have done this, right? Because they recognize how reckless the legislator is. And the legislator is just the people. The people keep wanting to not be the legislator, but the legislator is just the people. And so um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a, it's a pervasive tragedy that comes without unwillingness to reckon with um, how difficult it is for some people to, to grow and how tragic some of the mistakes that folks make are. I mean, how tragic some of the crimes that people commit are, but that um, that as a society, we have to imagine something beyond that tragedy. And we shouldn't have a system that stops at the tragedy. Every time a cop kills somebody, everybody wants to be like, it's an accident. Let's imagine more. Let's imagine what they were going through. But like when when it's the other side, like nobody can. And I, and I think that it's um, really important that we find ways to do so. Right. Thank you for that. That um, that was my last question. And so now um, we'll bring Dean Detlef back for closing. Well, thank you, Alexandria. I really appreciate you being part of this event and for leading us through that great discussion. And thank you again to Reginald Dwayne Betts for joining us, sharing your work with us. Um, and as you said, he hearing your work in this different medium really has has a different impact, had a different impact for me, um, and I hope had a different impact for many of our students. And I really appreciate you giving us this preview uh, of your work in this way. Um, for all of you who are watching us, I hope that you'll continue to share your thoughts about today's event um, on your social media channels, continue to engage with us. I wanna thank our incredible staff, Renia Butler, Connie Swarren, everyone in our communications department to help make this a success. Um, at, at the GCSW, we're committed to continuing this, these conversations. So I hope you'll stay connected to us via our social media channels, our website, our electronic newsletter. If you're interested in learning more, um, all of the events in our Eyes on Abolition series are available on our website. It's uh.edu slash social work. Um, this was the sixth event in our series. So if you haven't watched our prior events, please go to our website and look at the other events in our series. And although this is the last event of this academic year, um, we will be continuing our conversations about abolition of carceral systems through our collaboration with the Center for the Study of Social Policy and the Upend Movement to Abolish the Child Welfare System. So I hope you'll save the date and plan to join us on May 18th for the first event in our new webinar series on how we end up. And this first event will focus on Black feminist dreams for the future. So May 18th, I hope you'll join us for that. Thank you all for joining us today. Please continue to share your thoughts 
and I hope to see all of you again soon.